The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. From the time I was a baby Christian, I had a vision of a dome, saw it manifest in various forms, but God has lifted it to a whole nother level. Something He gave me 42 years ago, only within the last few weeks has it really dawned on me that, the, that it's a much bigger concept. And I'm not going to teach on it today, but I am going to teach you what you can do to prepare for what God has ahead. But I know that I know. I was only in a trance one time that was actually a trance, and God gave me a heavenly vision of how to change my life in this temple of the Holy Spirit. And then when I pastored my first church, took those same principles and said, you train them up the same way. The difference is they were trained for in a building. What he's going to change now is he's going to train you for the, the pillars of society to where you spend 90% of your life. In other words, it's going to be like John Wesley did. He basically turned England upside down because he trained them for the marketplace. He did not train them for just inside of a building. In the building, that's where they had the accountability. That's where they had the opportunity to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. So uh, I'm quoting, I quoted him last week, I think, but I really like this quote. How many know that Leo Tolstoy wrote War and Peace, right? There's a quote that was really, in, I don't know about later on in life, but in those years, that was his search for God in, in, the, in the time that he was writing War and Peace. But Leo Tolstoy said, the only significance of life, come on, especially you young people, you're looking for your significance. The only significance to your life, and you're going to look back on this someday, and listen to some of us old people who've been there, done that. The only significance is to what degree in this life are you advancing the kingdom of God? Not advancing your interests, not advancing your family, not advancing your likes and hobbies. Is basically to what degree, answer that question, are you advancing the kingdom of God? Because if your vision doesn't begin with God and end with God, you're basically pretty hung up on self. And in many cases, you could very easily be serving mammon instead of God. And I'll, trust me, you cannot serve two masters. You'll think you can, you can tag the name God onto it. But if it isn't really the passion of Him expanding the kingdom of God, there needs to be some reorientation. So take the, word, take the words of a man searching with all of his heart. And the war and peace can be on the inside as well as the outside. And the only significance of life consists in helping to establish the kingdom of God. You are called with one purpose. And the eternal purpose, and it's clear in Scripture, you can't, there's no disputing this. This is not open for debate or doctrinal dis dispute. The eternal purpose was that you would bring many sons unto glory. Yes. You are called to go ye into all the world and make, not converts, disciples. To the degree that you do that. And it doesn't mean you have to be a preacher. That's nonsense. Actually, Wesley turned the world upside down with what he called lay leaders. You don't need a title. They were just people. <laughs> and they changed the world because they impacted the Jesus they had where they are at. And so here's an illustration. When God gave me that, that, that vision of a dome and the pillars and all that it represents and uh, so much more, He's actually elevated it to a much higher level. Basically, He's saying that it was a house, that you are a house. How many know that you're a house? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? You're living stones, meaning by yourself, don't get too proud of what you can or can't do because by yourself you remain a stone. Living stones were meant to come together. That's the proof of the real quality of what God is doing in your life. But here's a way to, to, to look at it that really to me made it clear. God showed me that that dome really meant no roof at all. And it was three pillars which was the structures of of the anointing and the character development, and those there was no walls. There was only the foundation, 
And no other foundation can man lay but through Jesus, an intimate relationship with Him. So there was no walls and no ceiling, just an atmosphere for a ceiling. He was both the foundation stone and the capstone. He was the atmosphere that flows out of you of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. It's the glory of God, basically. Now, I saw that my life, if properly founded, that there was a genuine work of the cross that took me through various levels of understanding and still is. But that God's desire for you and me is to be a house without a roof and without walls. Now, here's a simple picture of that. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart at conversion, and many of you publicly declared it, all right? Now, let's say you accepted Jesus in this church for the first time today, and you came forward. Now, what you did, nobody saw you do it, right? Because it was what? You asked him to come into your heart. You asked him to come into your heart. There was a transformation. And then you believed in your heart, but you confessed with your mouth. And the moment you confess Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, the minute you confess it, you blew the roof off and the walls are down. Instantly. The roof was that which separated you and God. There's no roof now. Jesus is Lord of my life. He's my head. He's my covering. He's my foundation and my covering. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's my beginning, he's my last, and he's also the, the person who's working me through my maturity. The roof was blown off. And now, I don't care if there's people that hated you in that audience, if there was people that were saved, unsaved. The minute you confessed with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, the walls went away. Can you picture that? You blew the, by walls, I mean, there's nothing between you and them. You got really vulnerable. You might not like that word vulnerable, but that's what happened. And you know why? That is why I think uh, ministries like Women's Aglow and Full Gospel Businessmen were so popular uh, during that season because they gave people, you didn't have to be a preacher. All you had to do is be a believer and have a genuine experience in God. But when you testified of a transformation, you blew the roof off. And, and many of those meetings had more anointing than some churches. Why? Because it was real what they were saying. They weren't giving secondhand. They weren't an echo. They were the voice of God. Right? Just giving a testimony. I'm not talking about preachers. I'm talking about believers. They were the voice of God because they said, I used to be an alcoholic, but God delivered me. And by golly, now I am Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. They blew the roof off. They blew the walls out. And that anointing came out of them. Watchman Nee struggled for years saying the problem with the church is it was easy to get Jesus in. They couldn't get him out because people put up walls almost immediately. There is, and we've taught this for many years, no legitimate wall other than the peace of God which will guard your heart and your mind. You don't need walls. You need to be a church without walls. I've seen churches that were named church without walls, but I didn't understand their concept. I understand what God is saying by church with no walls. He's basically saying the only way this can happen is basically when you say, I want to connect with God. And this is the way our house groups are going to be connect, right? Transform. What's the transformation? The transformation is in small groups, you drop your walls. You can play church and hide all your sin and go to church every Sunday. But don't expect more when in reality you've got walls. And those walls can be hurt, fear. I got wounded in church. Well, God doesn't have a plan B, so what are we going to do for you? I think somehow you have to resolve that wall. I don't care who the perpetrator was, it's your wall. You put up the wall. I don't go to church no more. Just me and God. What are they saying when it's just me and God? I've got walls. That's not, 
God tried to, at conversion to break you free from the wall of what people say, and it's all of, let Jesus have the last word in my life. And if you're afraid of that kind of stuff, you'll never grow. You'll live an intimidated, menial life of insecurity, fear, and, and uh, uh, suspicion, paranoia. I mean, you don't want to be a paranoid Christian. You see that person on a cell phone over there? I think they're talking about me. <laughs> Who wants to live like that? You don't want to live like that. But you know when you don't have walls? Peace is, guard peace is your wall. It's guarding your heart and your mind out of, that, out of that intimate relationship with God. You will have discernment instead of the opposite, which is fault finding and paranoia. Matter of fact, having discerning of spirits from the time I was a baby Christian, that grieved me more than anything else. How many people had paranoia, fault finding, and called it discernment? They're just hiding their insecurities behind suppositions, guesses. But God's basically saying, look, I want to blow the roof off and I want you to be intimate with me. And reading the apologies of some of the greatest men in history, don't you think we ought to learn from history? Yeah. George Whitfield was grieved that what Wesley did was had small groups who kept each other accountable. Not in a rigid kind of way, just accountable like, are you walking the walk this week? Did you struggle? Let's pray about it if you did. All, all, all he did is he took people from all levels and all walks of life, all levels of intelligence, all levels of, of career, and all he did was taught them how to keep the walls down. That simple. But that does not exist in the church. You play games in the church. You don't want anybody to know, you, so you put up a wall to protect yourself. The minute you do that, you cut God out. So you're not as spiritual as you think you are when you have walls. And God has given us a beautiful solution. of teaching people how to properly forgive and how beautiful that gift of forgiveness is. To forgive. I, I just heard someone uh, uh, quote a scripture I haven't heard for a long time, but judge not lest you be judged. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. I think it was a, just a little clip that I saw. Now, look at that in the context. Judge not lest you be judged with the measure you use, judging, will come back to you. It's like, be not deceived, God's not mock what you sow, you reap, correct? So that means if you're a judge, a suspicious person, let that reasoning mind make assumptions and guesses as to other people's motives. Real discernment knows the motive. But you start making guesses, you're judging. And you're not just gonna get judged because you're judging. You're gonna reap a harvest of judging. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Oh, I didn't know that part. <laughs> but that's the context of that scripture. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. And what's the context? Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. If we can raise up a forgiveness church, I mean, you are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. You would reap a harvest of such blessing. You wouldn't be all preoccupied with who doesn't like you and who your enemy is and who's saying something against you. In this world, you'll have tribulation. In this world, you're going to have, but be of good cheer. I've overcome its ability to harm you. That's the message translation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome its ability to harm you. If you've got walls of peace, it can't harm you anyway. And you go, oh, that's too bad. I'd have loved on them anyway. That's the way you should be responding is to get all hurt and wounded like an immature child. The key to what lies in the days ahead is going to be a church without walls and without a roof. And the only way you can maintain that is not spaghetti dinners. And I don't care how many years you've spent in home groups. What God is laying on our heart, it's not like going to be like that. Our house groups are not going to be like that. So don't say, I know what they're like. I've been doing this and I've done this and I've done. I don't care what you've done in the past. It's going to be different. You scared yet? <laughs> 
trying to try to see if you got walls. I'm trying to push on them walls. But in reality, I'll tell you what, you've never enjoyed life more than, do you know how free you are that first time you got saved and you told a bunch of saved or unsaved people, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Did you ever go to work and tell a bunch of unsaved people that I'm a born again Christian, washed in the blood of Jesus and I love it? Huh? Was there a freedom in that? Are you afraid to do that now? It makes a difference because one determines whether you've got walls or not. I say it's time to get down those walls. God's basically saying, I'll never forget as long as I live. It was basically God says, I'm going to connect with you. I'm going to be the Alpha and the Omega. I'm going to be the beginning and the end. And he still is. And quite frankly, again, to expand the kingdom of God is my primary interest. Not about my ministries, not about this, not about that. Those are just merely uh, vehicles that God has picked and chosen. I didn't pick it and I didn't choose him. I didn't choose to be a pastor. I accepted the call. I didn't choose full stature ministry. I didn't choose team embassy. I didn't choose Kingdom Life Church. Those things were what God laid on the heart and I was obedient to do it. But it's for the expansion of the Kingdom of God. We didn't choose to write a book until God told. Matter of fact, most of the time we were contacted, right? Because I don't know, but we've got a lot of people that like to promote themselves. But in reality, God will promote you better than you could ever promote yourself anyway. Why not you let Him do it and get out of the way? Amen. Huh? Do you realize how many years you've wasted trying to do what you think you need to do? And in reality, God can do it in a minute, but you don't have the humbleness of heart to just stand still and see if God will be the initiator instead of you and your good ideas. Man, I'll tell you. I, I, there are some mistakes I only made once, and I'm going to do it again. And that was everything I've ever started worked to this day. It worked. Can you go backwards and say that? Everything you ever did worked? Everything I ever did worked. But the one time I did it on my own, it didn't work, and I never forgot that. I knew I was called to plant churches. I knew I was called to start it. And guys in my office said, Dennis, you, this Bible study is not good enough. You need to start a church. And I already knew that was in there, right? So you can get confused when that happens. You can get a, a good idea and a God idea can be real close, <laughs> except not really. <laughs> so we went and rented a little room. Thirteen of us stood, held hands, and the Lord spoke in almost an audible voice. I'm not in this, Dennis. I didn't tell you to do this. Did you know it took four international leaders to get me to start my first church? <laughs> they had to take me out to lunch and convince me it was time because I'm not doing that again. Some of you need that. Some of you need to crash and burn and, and so that God can raise your dream up out of the ashes because you've cultivated your dream in your own image and in your own liking and in your own energy. And God said, except the Lord build a house, you labor in vain. The quicker I could convince young people to learn that lesson, the more successful they will be in fulfilling their destiny. Now you can be successful without fulfilling your destiny. A lot of unsaved people consider themselves successful. But destiny always includes success. You fulfill your destiny, it will always include the advancement of the kingdom of God. Businesses will rise and fall. Jobs will change. The day of my fathers are gone. You know, when they, when they got married, they were going to work at the same job for 30 or 40 years, retire with a pension. Huh? Come on, any old timers recognize that? Wasn't that a common belief? That you would get a job, you'd be there for a lifetime, and you'd retire with a pension. That doesn't happen anymore. You're going to have to learn to trust with God and let Him build and get you in the right place at the right time instead of you trying to figure out how to do that. And you're going to have to drop the walls and build relationship because God's not going to do it. Fulfill your destiny apart from the body of Christ. If you're a Lone Ranger, it will not work. Right? I'm 70 now. I'm allowed to say the truth now. I guess before I would hold back. <laughs> Uh, before I was always afraid you're going to hold, hurt somebody's feelings when they said God told me. Do you know how many times I heard people say God told me and my insides went eh? But you want them to stand on their own two feet so you let them do whatever they want to do. Ah, not anymore. If you've got the guts to ask me before you make a decision, don't ask me after, don't tell me what your decision was after you made the decision. That, that, that means nothing to me. 
say, bring it and get a consensus of the brethren. You know, there's a lot of pastors that have gone astray lately into heretical teaching because the consensus of the brethren, they don't understand my revelation. They don't understand my vision. A lot of big names in my day, and they're all kind of goofy right now, still. Huh? But they were very, very mainstream, prevalent leaders in the 70s. God, blow our walls out. You know, the scripture says, He Himself is our peace. He broke down the dividing walls between Jew and Gentile and made one new man out of the two. Do you know He's still trying to make one new man out of the body? And there's going to be things that have separated themselves kind of naturally. It's going to have to change. What do I mean by separating naturally? Well, it's natural for the rich and the poor to make a distinction. It's natural to separate black and white. It's natural to separate young and old. But the real work of the Holy Spirit is to say that. I don't care what's natural. The real work of the Spirit is get us a little taste of heaven where you don't see that kind of distinction. You don't see a distinction between young and old. You see that which may naturally have gravitated apart is going to naturally come together by the power of the Spirit. That's what God's going to do in the day and ahead. You want to be serious about what God is, you're going to have to reconsider the way you think. That's the truth. You're going to have to reconsider the way you think because God's not about the way that your flesh wants to go. God's about the way the kingdom wants to go. And that's a kingdom concept to bring together those things that would naturally drift apart. Basically, God's saying, well, let's face it, that, that's what heaven is going to be like, but this is your rehearsal. <laughs> let's get it right. God's given us the beautiful opportunity to practice. And practice makes permanent. Let's get better at this. Huh? God is equipping a net. Jennifer had a, had a vision of... Um, you, want, you want to share it? I'll give you a microphone here. I want, this is good to be on video because I want her to say it. It was so real and it just came to fruition recently as to uh, what it meant. Um, I saw... A whole large group of young people, millennial age, and I didn't understand it in this vision. I saw them throwing white ropes out, holding on to the end of it, but throwing out the end of white ropes. And then I thought, what on earth is that, Lord? Because usually I get a little clarity quicker than that. And I saw Sid Roth's hand reach out and gather together those ropes and weave them into a net. And then a short time after that, I saw uh, an article that said around 21% of Jewish millennials, unsaved Jewish millennials, believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Unsaved Right, and, and Sid is taking steps now to reach out to the millennial age. And they're going to be woven into the net. It's going to be young and old together. It's going to be the boomers and beyond to the millennials and younger that God's going to bring into the net because it's going to take young and old to bring in this harvest and hold them and hold them. And as, okay. and as God showed us the same thing of what he wanted to do with us in these house groups to bring that kind of thing together, Sid got us on the side and said, by the way, when you start developing this, we, we need to have something for their website for people. Because here's the testimonies. Billy Graham said it. He wished there would have been discipleship. John Whitfield said that John Wesley's disciples, he led millions to the Lord, but he said, but he said his disciples were like a rope of sand. Whitfield, Whitfield did because Wesley had a system of accountability. Now, people are always afraid of strict, but I'm just saying, forget the word strict. How about real? Well, just be real. 
and allow the opportunity for you to keep those walls down because that's what turned England upside down was the ability for people, everyday people, not super spiritual leaders and giant superstars and Joe Heavy speakers. It was basically people who on a weekly basis were able to keep the walls down. I had a rough week this week. I got a, got a traffic, I didn't, but I'm just saying, hypothetical, got a traffic ticket. I knew I shouldn't have been doing that. You know that that's healthy to say something like that as a believer to somebody else. Receive forgiveness for that kind of impulsiveness. And I know I was a little hasty that week. Do you know that you just dropped the wall, that you will be the stronger for it? Amen. That's, that's real life Christianity. And so what we say, basically, uh, we want to go deeper. And I, I want it to be a little rehearsal for what's going to be heaven is going to be like. It's going to be young and old, rich and poor. It's going to be all people together, all races, because Jesus himself is our peace. In other words, he broke down the dividing wall, became the wall. The only legitimate wall is let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. That's not supposed to be a cute saying. That's supposed to be the way you live. Because when you're at peace, it's what Watchman Nee saw. He saw it was easy to get him in. But he said the release of the Spirit was the real challenge for believers. Getting him out. And I told you folks at the time we had cassette tapes. And my sister at that time was running the, uh, the cassette thing. And she titled that message, How to Get God Out of Your Life. It wasn't quite what I meant, but yeah, it was, right? Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. You need to be an express, you can't be an expression of God with walls. Did you know discerning people will just feel your walls? They don't know you by the Spirit. They'll know you only by the flesh because you got walls. Who in the world wants to live like that? All that fear, it's the devil's kingdom. It's a fear wall. Any wall of your own construction is from the wrong kingdom. God basically showed me, you know, I look at all those cro uh, river crossers, all the crossing the Red Sea and crossing the Jordan. And, and I said, you know, I just had this little, just dropped in my spirit. I got excited about Peter. I said, when Peter walked on water, I said, most of those miracles point to something else. I said, I, I, I just felt like it pointed to that sea of glass that the day is going to come when the saints can walk on the sea of glass. I don't know what it's made out of, but I think that's a beautiful opportunity to walk in a dimension beyond what you've known so far. Now, and who knows what this is going to look like in the days ahead. We've got nine pastors. Now, nine of us have had this for years. I've got nine pastors, even when we had 50 people, I still had nine pastors. They've been with me for 15 or 20 years. Stand up if you're one of my pastors. Most of them are out of the room right now, I think. But just stand up if you're one of our pastors. And Rebecca's standing already. We did traveling ministry. They dropped their walls. Clippenstein of Massachusetts. Vicki, her sister brought her, right? <laughs> years ago, lived with us for three years, got discipled. Molly, she's up at Cape Cod right now, Massachusetts. We would go to a Boston church, they'd be there. We'd go to a Sturbridge, Massachusetts church, they'd be there. They got the same DNA, and they go, they know they were in the right place at the right time, and they went with their heart instead of their head because their head, it wasn't convenient. It wasn't convenient for Cliff to come down here without a job. But God was saying, come down. So, you know, if people learn to go with their heart, this is your work, Carol, <laughs> and not wrestle with this. I have learned in 43 years of being a Christian, I am more confident in the rule of peace in my heart than all the amount of rational information you can give me. If I had peace in my heart, I don't care how ridiculous it looked or sounded. 
I don't regret going with the peace of God. Now, don't use that as an expression like, oh, I got peace about buying that new car. No, that's lust. There's a difference between, <laughs> don't just use Christianese, all right? If the motor's going on inside, that's not peace. How many want to practice getting rid of the walls? Did you know that if you forgive from the heart, that you are going to get pressed down, shaken together, and running over? The grace and the forgiveness from multitudes of sources? Wouldn't it be wise to just live that way? Just think. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So if you forgive, it's pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It's a harvest. I'll tell you, it will make you want to forgive, not I have to forgive because the Bible says I have to. It'll make you want to knowing there's a harvest of coming. You want mercy? Yeah. Mercy will triumph over judgment. But guess what? That fact won't apply to you unless you actually apply sowing mercy. I've showed the old man, that's the Old Testament love message. The Old Testament love message was Micah 6 8. I've showed the old man what the Lord does require. Do justice, love mercy. What's the church do? Loves justice and does some occasional mercy. Okay, that has to flip-flop. Love mercy, do justly. You love mercy, mercy will be extended to you. Some of you are in a hard place right now. I just feel like the Lord just give me a word of knowledge. There's some of you a real hard place at work right now, and, and you're, you're thinking of quitting. And God's saying, you start forgiving and extending mercy, and I will show my hand strong on your behalf. I don't know if that applies to anybody in the room or if that's for you stream, but you take it. Just take it. Don't quit. You let God lead you and guide you. He'll tell you when the time is over. And in some cases, he says, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west, but it's God that lifts one up and puts down another. So you let, you let him be in charge and not you. Did you know that New Jerusalem that comes out of heaven? How many have ever read in the, in the scripture, I, John, saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned. Now who's this bride? Come on. All right, well, this is a new Jerusalem. It's coming out of heaven. And basically, its length, its breadth, its height are equal. You know what that makes it? A cube. What's it say in Ephesians? That you would love the Lord your God, the height, that you would know experientially the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. The first rebuke I got from the Lord, one of the first, I had a lot of rebukes, but the first rebuke I got from the Lord was... I was getting a little excited that I, I had such a quality prayer life compared to even when I'm listening to other people talk, it didn't sound like they had much. And so I'm thinking, wow, I'm a worshiper. And boy, yeah, I've got victory over the devil. These people are always complaining, the devil's beating them up, and I'm going, I got victory over the devil. And then I'm going, and vision, I was giving pastors when I was a baby Christian vision. And they go, yeah, yeah, we know this is probably another dome vision from Dennis. Okay, well, just let, you know, hold back, Dennis, and everything. And then the Lord got me, and he says, I want you to see what your building looks like. I go, okay. He said, oh, you're a worshiper, Dennis. It's tall like a skyscraper. Oh, that skyscraper's got a good foundation. You've got victory over the devil. Oh, and it's long because you've got vision. Oh, you've got vision for other people to give them vision because they don't have any vision. But you're so skinny, the wind can blow you over. You don't have the width. And I was crushed. And I'm going, what's the width? <laughs> well, you mumble when you cut the grass. You don't, want to take, you don't want to do anything that's not spiritual. You don't want to take the garbage out. You don't want to do yard work. You don't want to do... I cried and cried and cried because I didn't want a skinny widow building. That was tall and deep and long and skinny. <laughs> The wind would knock it over. So he taught me to enjoy him in the most mundane activity and the most areas of dislike I had. Bring me into that area. So I started cutting the grass with the Lord, and I was going, wow. I can feel his presence doing stuff I never liked to do. 
they're going to do taking out the garbage, burning the papers. I, I, was, I was enjoying God in all these, wow, this is like 24-7. You can really enjoy Him. And then all of a sudden, I went, I enjoy cutting the grass. And all of a sudden, my neighbor comes over and he goes, Dan, you got to do me a favor. I want to buy a riding lawnmower, and my wife says that my yard's not big enough. But if I would cut your grass and their grass, it would justify buying it. <laughs> Knock yourself out. You can cut my grass the rest of your life. God supernaturally provided 12 acres for my first church. Supernaturally. 12 acres of beautiful land. And all I could do was look at it, and I'm trying to rejoice in God, rejoice in God, because there was a whole series of miracles that went with it. And I'm looking at him going, who's going to cut this grass? And I went, uh-oh, oh, I ain't going there. God, if you want me to cut the 12 acres of grass, I'll do it. I don't know with what. I'm picturing a push lawnmower. Somebody says, there's a company, a Christian guy for John Deere tractors. And uh, he wants to lease it to you and lease it to the church with the mower, snow plow, everything, with the, that all, the money going toward it is toward purchase. And in a very short period of time, we had, a, we had our own tractor. And I'm going, oh, God is so good cutting this grass. I'll tell you what, it, if you deal with it in your heart, Matters of the heart are the heart of the matter. It's not about what goes on up here. This can, this can get you off track real easy, but this will keep you even keel. So keep the walls down, and the things that are, that are walls to you right now, let's blast them out today. Anybody have any walls? Something you don't want to think about? Something you put off? That wall is actually preventing you from being in the right place at the right time for God's provision. There's walls in the church. There's walls in a hostile environment. Here's the first set of walls. If you're a note taker, just, I'm going to just give you some homework here. We teach it in our modules. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. Hell flags, H-F-L-A-G-S. And for each one of those initials, there's a word. H-F-L-A, H flags. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, those are walls. That is not God. But God gave you the provision of forgiveness to say, I'm not giving those place in my life because they're coming between me and God. And if they're coming between me and God, they're coming between you and other people. Hmm? There's no such thing as, I've got the roof off and it's me and God. I've got walls. I don't go to church because me and God have this great relationship. That's a lie. It's an absolute impossibility to have a great relationship with God. It's those Christians you can't handle. <laughs> that is not a deep love message. That's shallow, and it's actually deceptive. All of those walls are coming from the kingdom of fear. Hurt, fear, lust, anger. they're all coming from the devil's kingdom. So it's not a God wall, that's for sure. And the only way you can get that wall to be peace is what? Forgiveness and repentance is the only way there's an internal transformation and a removal of the wall. The one that I see the most is that Satan wants to appeal to the mind of reason, God wants, and, and poverty, that you're missing something. His number one tactic for Christians is poverty. In other words, not poverty, but you're holding out. I'm holding out for you. You're making him sound like he's stingy. And he'll appeal to the mind of reason. But God wants you to appeal to the tree of life. That he is your promised land. What was that that I was just reading when Joshua said, give me my mountain? How many know you've heard that before? I Caleb. Caleb, I'm sorry, not Joshua. Well, Joshua and Caleb were only the ones that had the right attitude. But Caleb said, give me my mountain. Hmm? 
Do you know what that's a type of for us? You don't to ask for God to give you your mountain. That was his inheritance, his allotment. You know what your allotment is under the new covenant? Jesus himself. He translated us out of the kingdom of darkness and translated it into the kingdom of the son of his love. Your allotment is him. Too many are claiming their mountain as a thing. No, your inheritance under the new covenant is him. If you don't see it that way, you're looking for stuff. The walls of pride. Ten things pride says. You're not going to write all these down. Just listen. Close, just close your eyes and say, God, if there's any of that in me, get, go for it. All right? Pride says we're not so bad. <laughs> pride will agree for assistance. They'll make an appointment to talk with somebody, but not necessarily surrender. Do you know the difference? I'll talk to somebody, but I'm necess not necessarily going to yield to their advice. Mm -hmm. What will others think of me if they knew? Pride doesn't understand why the Bible calls us sinners. <laughs> it refuses to honor God as God. Pride does not want to give God his rightful place. That's a trust issue. Pride allows life to revolve around us and not God. Pride keeps self on the throne as well as the works of the flesh. Pride eventually can lead to a reprobate mind. If God is not God, then sin is not sin. Have you ever heard that in the world now? Have you ever seen that creep into the church? There's no heaven, there's no hell, and there's no sin. But this is the one that God is going to look. This is what I believe we're going to cultivate in the days ahead. This is the one, this is Isaiah 66, verse 2. This is the one that I'm going to look, saith the Lord. This is the one that I'm going to look. Him who is of a poor and a contrite spirit who trembles at my word. Here's the, here's the way this would appear. Someone who trembles at God's word is easy to contact spirit to spirit. If a person is in love with the living word, you can touch them by the spirit. Good day, bad day, you know them by the spirit, not according to some kind of persona that they want to project on you as to what they want you to see when you look at me. Because God forbid you would see the way I really am. But a person who is humble before the Lord, they don't have walls. You touch them by the Spirit. You know them by the Spirit. I used to be able to lay down in a worship service in my first pastorate, uh, uh, worship service, wor worship practice. Because in those days, there was like four different worship teams, and they all would practice. I would go get a pillow and lay down. And someone would come over and touch me on the shoulder and just pray for me without saying a word. And I'd say, that's Kathy, because I could feel the mercy. Knew her so well by the Spirit. Walked by my office, I would know which one that was walking by my office based on their spirit. You need to get to that place. You can't have walls. You'll never know that without dropping the walls in your own life. Peace is the only legitimate wall that will guard your heart and your mind. And it is evidence of what? The Lordship of Jesus. Let the peace of God rule. The second thing, highly sensitive. You don't miss a move in another spirit, person's spirit. I can tell when somebody is talking to me if they're explaining something unnecessarily overcompensating. You will feel a, okay, I, I heard you the first time. But that extra energy is, no, uh, uh, you, you don't understand. Or, you're not hearing me. Old counselor talk used to be, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Sometimes you have to tell them, I hear you. Okay? But that's perceptible. But you should be able to know when someone's doing that how to respond appropriately. Because there's a loving response to other people's reactions. You should cultivate your spirit to be sensitive that way. It says, 
I will train you and disciple you and I will give you the tongue of a, dis of a, of a disciple, one who knows how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. So if the person was weary, apprehensive, you would know how to speak that word in season, not just a canned answer. The third element, and this is my, well, for the next 90 days, I'm going to be interceding for just this, because this is, this is a blind spot. Ready for corporate life. The capacity not to go to church, the capacity to touch the spirit of the body. In the natural, you have it in family, right? There is a thing that you can't, there is existence in a human family, something you can't explain, but it's really there. There's an entity there called relationship that you just, no, but you're probably not good at explaining it. That is supposed to exist in the kingdom of God at an even higher level. This is my mother, my brother, my sisters, they who do the will of God from the heart. There should be this ability to touch the body, not just be part of a crowd. And it's a blind spot for the most part because it requires a spiritual sensitivity to know who are you, where do you live <laughs> in the kingdom? Who are you, where do you live what do you do for a living? If you were in an accident and you went to the ER and you couldn't answer those three questions, I'll guarantee you they'll keep you. <laughs> who am I? Where do I live? And what do I do for a living? I don't know who I am. I don't know where I live. I don't know. In the kingdom of God, it's the same. If you can't answer those questions, there's a certain amount of disorientation in your life. And it will invariably be walls. Who am I? Where do I live? For God has placed the solitary in families. So you might have a better idea, but that's what God did. That's what God wants to do, and He doesn't have a plan B. Ready for corporate life. They touch the spirit of the body and they belong. This is a good serious question. The house groups will definitely bring that to the surface, right? This is where you belong. First place is you've got to get so secure that I belong to God, and because I belong, I've got a lot to give. That's a healthy inside attitude, but that's a healthy way to touch the rest of the body. And lastly, when it comes to instruction within a family setting, they connect or touch with the spirit of the teaching. Like if you're truly part of this family, you're touching my heart, not just the words that I speak. One of the biggest giveaways that somebody's not connected is they go, well, what did he mean when he said that? Did that mean that I don't know? Because it goes up to here. I mean, when you connect in a family, come on, even if you've got a crazy uncle, when you connect with a family, don't you know a lot of times what they meant when they said it wrong? That's what I'm talking about. This is giving me an excuse so now if I say a bunch of wrong stuff. Just like Cliff and Stina fell off a couch listening to me when they lived in Massachusetts because I got excited about the woman that, that uh, washed Jesus' feet, dried him with her hair, and I said, just like that woman that washed Jesus' hair. <laughs> Once it's, once it's out there, it's kind of hard. We can't pull it back. But you know what? I bet you the average person would know what he meant, but I bet you there's a percentage of people that watch you stream or whatever. That's not scriptural. Did you hear what he said? No woman ever washed Jesus' hair. And write a big thing on Facebook about nobody ever washed Jesus' hair. No woman ever did that. <laughs> Those are people that are not connected. Trust me, they're not connected. They hide behind their arguments. And it actually exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Walls of self-effort. First word that the Lord taught me because I was a hyperactive Christian. 
He taught me to sit still. I like John Wesley's solution here. He was talking about the difference between there's the zeal of the Lord and then there's fleshly zeal. Dake in his uh, annotated Bible called it uh, from the Greek word zeloi, which means emulation. He called it an uncurbed rivalry spirit in business or religion. Do you think that's possible? Yeah. That's why there's burnout. An uncurbed rivalry spirit in business or religion. He called that zeal. But listen to John Wesley. Love this. I wish I could have been a, known him. He says, lead urgently. So I, that caught my attention. Lead with focused intensity and directed energy. When the mission is compelling enough, urgency is the only appropriate response. Though I am always in haste, I am never in a hurry. <laughs> he saved himself here. I never undertake any more work than I can go through with perfect calmness of spirit. There's an intense individual. To accomplish more with less effort. These are goals. Someone say, remember the time we taught in New England on forgiveness? And a man came up and said, that was a wonderful message on forgiveness. That was a very lofty message. You don't expect us to do that, do you? <laughs> he was serious. <laughs> that's the way we hear stuff sometimes. Well, that's a pretty lofty message. You don't expect me to do that, though, do you? No, I don't. I expect you to... Do what we've taught over and over again. We fight by dying and we live by yielding or surrendering. When you surrender to Him, God does the work. For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. You should never be burned out. If you're being burned out and there's, there's something wrong with your focused intensity and your directed energy, when the mission is compelling enough, urgency is the only appropriate response. And what's difficult is I can wait for months and months and months, just like with these house groups, and not develop them. I could go for years and not develop them. And then God can drop it in my spirit and say, now's the time and I'm going to go fast. Fast and furious. Because it's His timing, not mine. I learned that the hard way. I don't care about all the good ideas I have in my head. I've got a lot of good ideas. I probably got more vision than many of you have. That sounds a little arrogant, but I don't care. I've got a lot of vision. But you know what? I won't do anything that God's not prompting me to do at the time He's telling me to do it. That's right. And some of these ministries are trying to do everything. Find out who you really are and just accomplish that purpose. Find out where your DNA is and make that kind of connection. God places a solitary in families. Then what will emerge is that corporate gifting, just like that couple over there. God will cause it to emerge. There is gifting that you will never enter into until the walls are down in your heart, your heart's right, and then because individual gifting is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your corporate gifting. There's a gifting that you, until you are in a right relationship in a body of Christ, it will not emerge. Hmm? How many understand that? Raise your hand if you even understand what I'm saying. It won't emerge because you're, you're not in the place where you can uh, function. You've already got an opinion. So, Father, we just say to you to seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are thrilled and excited for the days ahead for what you're going to bring to pass in our timetable. And God, those good things that you're doing in other ministries, even now, to, to, that you're speaking to leaders all over to make ready a people prepared for what God is about to do. Bless them right now, Lord Jesus. We release a loving intercession to them, causing them to find that structure, find that entity, learn how to, to lay aside some of the old ways, but also to recognize that like a householder, that God's going to take some of those things out of that storehouse that are fresh as well as familiar. So blend them together in the tapestry of your choice, God, not our good ideas, and we will welcome obedience. We will take baby steps of obedience in the days ahead to be... Uh, uh, adequate representatives of all that you'd have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. 
Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.